2, verses 1 through 12. Familiar text. You've heard it. I'm going to read it for you. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. And all Jerusalem with him, when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Okay, I have a question. How many of you, when in your life, maybe today is the day, did you realize that the wise men weren't at the manger. Do you guys remember when you found that out? Yeah. David? Right in my 20s. Probably, yeah, I was I probably was like, an adult. And I was like, what? Yeah, me too. It, it was in my adulthood when I realized it didn't play out exactly like we do in pageants. But isn't it pretty? <laughs> I love pageants, and I have a memory of uh, an incident that happened at my home church with two little cousins that are, are adults now. Uh, Mary and Joseph were kneeling around the manger while the shepherds and the angels stood around in bathrobes two sizes too big. <laughs> Just as the wise men proceeded up the aisle to their spot in the nativity, my little cousin Bethany, who was three, playing a donkey in the pageant, ran up to Cody, the second wise man, just as he approached and gave him a big kiss on the cheek. Of course, the crowd oohed and awed at that unbelievably cute and spontaneous gesture, and Cody handled it like a pro. He didn't make a face or wipe his cheek off feverishly like most seven-year-old magi might be prone to do. He simply went about his job of adoring the cabbage patch Jesus in the make-believe manger. He was truly a wise man. These two, I need to send this to these two kids um, because uh, they, I don't know if they know I've used them in a sermon over the years. So in this Matthew account, we find that the mysterious magi came from guided by a brilliant star and they traveled thousands of miles to get to Bethlehem. And they came long after the shepherd and the shepherd and the angels were at the, the manger. So, in fact, it was about a year after Jesus' birth, after having, having stopped in Jerusalem to visit Herod, that they arrived with Mary and Joseph at their house to see the toddler Jesus. And there's an artist's rendition of what that might have looked like in a house with Jesus being a toddler. Now, I know that there are a lot of cheesy jokes about the wise men, but here's one from my uncle. I was discussing the Magi with my uncle last week when he asked me an interesting question. Marie, have you ever wondered what would have happened if the wise men had been wise women? I said, no, Uncle Bob, what would have happened? Easy, they would have asked directions, been on time, and helped with the delivery. <laughs> There's a lot of jokes out there. I know if I could open the floor and you could share some with me, and I know there's probably a lot. There's one I found. Three wise men and you, and not one of you brought chocolate. You know, so there's, there's a lot out there. Um, 
The Magi were from Persia. They were part of a religious order like the Levites. And they were men of high position. They were astrologers who looked at the heavens for guidance. And in Jewish eyes, they were as pagan as can be. What are the implications of the fact that they were pagan, that they looked to the skies for direction? Not only were they pagan, they were foreigners. They were, however, aware of the Jewish expectations of a Messiah because they were really, really smart men, and they probably had access to copies of the Old Testament because of the Jewish exile centuries earlier. They were skilled in philosophy, medicine, natural science. They were soothsayers, or they told the future, and interpreters of dreams. It may seem to us extraordinary that those men should set out from the east to find a king, but the strange thing is that they set out on their journey at a time when people were waiting and looking for God to come to earth. Now, another fallacy is we see this pretty picture of the three men traveling. I don't know if I put that up. Oh, no, I didn't. Uh, three men traveling in the light of the star. But the reality is there was probably a lot of people in that, not just three. Due to the distance traveled and the fear of bandits, there could have been 20, 50, or even 100 people in the caravan. They were led by a star that suddenly appeared in the sky, which really signified to them that that was an important supernatural event, and that's when they dropped everything and began their journey. Now, it's significant that Jesus would engage these men through in the manner in which he did. They would not have followed an angel or scriptural revelation because they had the scriptural revelation, but God wanted these Eastern magicians at Jesus' house, so he invited them in a way that they would understand through the stars. Had you ever thought Jesus invited them in a way that they would understand? This miraculous phenomenon directed behind the scenes by God, the star remained stationary. It led them to Jerusalem, where the star stayed over Jerusalem. And then the star started moving and led them to the precise location where it stood still to mark the designated spot where Jesus was. So have you ever thought that the star moved and stopped and moved and stopped? That's pretty cool. It's clear that God was wooing these men. God was inviting them. How many times have we seen God inviting us into this story through the shepherds, through the angels? We've seen it. It's our merciful and loving God extending an invitation to the Magi in a powerful and awesome way. God takes the initiative. God takes the initiative in your life. God, if you look, God is, is inviting you all the time to him. So he invited these astrologers to the coming out party of Christ, which indicates this deep and wide mercy that God has and wants to all of us to see. What do you see? I see that that invitation was breaking down all kinds of barriers that separated these people from God. Whether it be that they were pagan, that they were foreigners, that they have different cultural and ethnic backgrounds. That God included them in the story. That God surmounts racial and moral, moral barriers to his saving work and that the church is to be all-inclusive, interracial, interracial, and merciful. God called us, and the Son calls us, precisely everybody, to be the people of God. And this is the first evidence of that. The Magi are a waking and walking illustration of God's universal love, God's universal mercy, and that divine invitation was received and obeyed by the wise men. Had you thought that? Some thought, well, the wise men were just there for credibility to suggest that Jesus was indeed a king. But it's broader than that. 
It's about God being inclusive to everybody and merciful and graceful. When the Magi arrived at the house where Jesus and his family lived, they saw the star immediately above the house, and Scripture tells us that they were overjoyed. Can you imagine how the neighbors buzzed about the three kings and their entourage who just pulled up in the driveway? I can't. At Joseph the carpenter's house of all places. They've been there a year, so Joseph had had to have been doing woodwork and carpentry work and was a working class guy. I'm certain that the small town was busy taking in the scene. The kings entered the place, saw Jesus with Mary, and immediately bowed down and worshipped him, giving gifts. You know the story, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Unusual gifts, but significant meanings. Not the kind that you would bring to a baby. Here's another corny story. A Sunday school teacher was telling her class of fourth graders the Christmas story about the three wise men bringing the gifts to the baby Jesus. A little girl who had recently become the big sister of a brand new baby brother said, well, I guess gold and all that stuff is all right, but I'll bet Mary really wished somebody had brought some diapers and wipes. <laughs> So these were very precious things. What were they? Symbols of who Christ was and who he had come to be. Gold, a gift benefiting a king. The royal medal. The second one was frankincense, a perfume or incense used by priests during worship to recognize the deity of Christ. And myrrh, a spice for persons who were going to die. It is no coincidence that these gifts were an acknowledgement by some non-Jewish astrologers that Jesus is the King of Kings, the Son of God, and the Savior of the world. Do you see that in those gifts? The King of Kings, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. That was the illustration. And if they were in tune, they got it. Gold for the king, frankincense for a deity that God has come, sent his son to earth in the form of a human, and then myrrh for somebody who was going to die to save the world. So Herod was so threatened by this babe that he tried to use the wise men to gain information about Jesus and destroy him. And that information or his desire for that led to what I alluded to earlier, the, the slaughter of the innocents, which is a very difficult text to preach. And what it was is Herod had all the firstborn males, two and under, killed in an effort to extinguish Jesus because he was so threatened. But the wise men did not go back and give Herod information like he had asked them to. As soon as they received God's instruction, um, they left the country. They received instruction to go home another way. So they didn't communicate with Herod again. This was the first act of civil disobedience. The first act of going against what somebody said was to be I mean, Herod made it a law that all the firstborn would die. They did not acquiesce. Now, sometimes when we encounter Jesus, we have to go home another way. David, your, your example of because you're a person of faith, you have to change your direction in regard to those friends. That's a perfect example. When we encounter Jesus, like the wise men, Sometimes we change our direction. I'm going to say most of the time we change our direction. I'm not sure I can think of any time that I haven't changed my direction after encountering Jesus. Can you? I haven't thought.
on one, but I'm assuming there are times when I've made a decision and I'm doing what God says and I encounter Jesus on the road saying, keep on, keeping on. That would be an example of, of not changing my direction. But most of the time, when I meet Jesus, I change my direction. Encountering Jesus face to face means going in that new direction, even though you might be a little unsure and you might not know what the future holds. Meeting Jesus personally gives rise to a new person in you, one that's made in Christ's likeness. Yeah, I really love Christmas pageants, even though sometimes they're not accurate. But I love them. Remember, it was the three year old Luke. In another Christmas play I was working with, whose job was it to walk to the mic at the end of the program and explain, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. And as he boldly walked forward that Sunday morning, the nervous preschooler loudly proclaimed, Merry Christmas and a Happy New You. And I think I like that one better, don't you? Because you can't come to Jesus without being changed.